Hi, I'm Kate Fulb. I'm Director of Hollywood Health and Society. Um, we are a program of the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism's Norman Lear Center. And welcome to tonight's discussion on hydroxychloroquine and lupus and in the age of COVID-19. Um, this is gonna be a really interesting discussion and I wanna get right to it so we don't uh, waste any time. Um, tonight's event is uh, supported by the Lupus Foundation of America. We're very grateful for their support um, as well as the Writers Guild East and West. Um, and we're holding these panels on a weekly basis every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, come back and see us every Tuesday at this time and you'll learn something new and interesting uh, in the world of health and science and medicine um, under the umbrella or the shadow of COVID-19. So um, just a quick commercial, Hollywood Health and Society, many of you know us. But those of you who don't, we're a free resource to the entertainment industry on all aspects of health, medicine, science, safety, and security. Uh, you can call us or email us at any time, and we can connect you with experts like those we have on our panel tonight um, to help you with your scripts and the projects you're developing. Our, uh, our services are free. We ask for no fee, we ask for no credit. We're here to help you get your storylines as accurate as possible um, so that you can do what you do best, which is tell fabulous stories. So without further, and we're all working. We're still working, we're all at home, but we're available. Um, you know our website, it's on the card that comes up at the end. Um, please feel free to reach out, we're here to help you. Um, okay, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our moderator for this evening, Bo Willeman, who is the president of the Writers Guild East and uh, showrunner extraordinaire. I'll turn it over to Bo and let him go from there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Uh, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us to uh, hear this discussion about this very important uh, topic. Um, I'd like to thank Hollywood Health and Society uh, for partnering with the Writers Guild of America uh, to, to make these resources available, not only to our membership, but we've opened it up to the general public as well. Um, so if you're a WGA member, welcome, happy to have you. And if you're not, welcome, we're happy to have you. Um, I especially want to thank our panelists. Uh, we've got a, a, a great group of experts tonight um, who are going to help educate us about uh, hydroxychloroquine. That's very, I've been practicing that all day. <laughs> it's a long one, it's a mouthful. Um, and, and also lupus, uh, which is a condition that that drug is often used to treat. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in and get to our panelists, do some brief introductions, and then we'll get to the discussion. Uh, if you have a question, you'll see that there's a Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen if you roll the cursor over the bottom, uh, and you can use that in order to type questions, uh, and that will go to our administrator and make their way to us. Uh, so you can start writing your questions now, or as soon as they come to you, uh, and then towards the end of the, the uh, e uh, evening, we will devote about 15 minutes to try to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, they include Dr. Georgina, uh, I have, sorry, I wanna make sure I get these bios correct. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Georgina Peacock, who's the director for the Division of Human Development and Disability at the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. She's also the co-lead of the Community Intervention and At-Risk Task Force for the CDC's COVID-19 response. Dr. Peacock, will you just say a quick hello so everyone can see your face? Hi, to... good to see everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Karen Kostenbader. Uh, she is the chair of the Medical Scientific Advisory Council for the Lupus Foundation of America, which is a multidisciplinary group of medical experts that address unmet needs in research and professional development efforts on lupus. She's also the director of the lupus program at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kostenbader, will you say hello? Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you tonight. 
We have uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Abella. He is the uh, professor of emergency medicine, attending physician in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Abella. Hi. Say- nice to meet you all. Uh, and finally, uh, we have <clears throat> Monique Gormassi, who is a Lupus Foundation of America ambassador and patient advocate from New York. She has lived with lupus for more than 10 years and has participated in numerous education programs, fundraising events, and public awareness initiatives. Most recently, she has done several media interviews sharing her own experience and challenges with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and I want to start with Monique uh, because you you can speak um, in, uh, you know in a, in a very particular way about the experience of living with lupus and what the current pandemic has meant to your meant to yourself and and others uh, who have lupus. Uh, so say hello to everyone, and then you know if you don't mind uh, breaking the ice here and just diving right right in and, and talk being the ambassador that you are. Um, I think that'd be a great way to kick off the evening. Hi all, Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for even just entertaining um, an idea of highlighting lupus. I am a patient um, and I'm thankful now to actually be a voice and an advocate for patients like myself, but that was not always the case. I was diagnosed in 2010, but it took me about two years to actually receive this diagnosis. And a lot of people find that hard to believe when they hear that I live in New York City, I have access to some of the best medical facilities and healthcare uh, practitioners, but it did take me um, two years to actually hear the words lupus. And the best way that I can explain it in uh, the layman terms that are understandable to me is that my body does not recognize foreign invaders, viruses, uh, illnesses. It sees my own organs, it sees all of my immune defenses as foreign invaders. And so it's so distracted trying to fight those invaders, internal invaders, which help me to live. And it does not actually pay attention to all the other extenuating viruses, um, illnesses that everyone else's immune system can fight off on their own. And I found out the hard way that lupus is not just a cold, which is what I thought it was, or I thought I could nap it away. I was actually diagnosed about two months before my wedding day. So a lot of what we thought were the symptoms might have been attributed to the stress of planning a wedding. And I have to say, I am married to the gentleman. He, he, he went along with this crazy plan. He believed in me, he believed in us, and he still decided to marry me and took his vows before he even had to. We knew nothing about lupus when I heard this diagnosis. And it was daunting. I was sick in so many different ways because lupus is uncertain. Some of the symptoms that I was presented with were extreme weight loss, fatigue, mouth ulcers, I lost orientation, Um, my blood count was up and down, I had a lot of swelling, a lot of pain, I lost mobility in in my limbs every now and again. We attributed that to being old sports injuries. And, you know, so I saw the physical therapist. I had an issue for about most of my childhood dealing with eczema. And so I had a lot of skin rashes and unknown lesions that I could not put my finger on. And unfortunately, they attributed that to the eczema or or just presenting itself again. Um, I was often very nauseous. I had... um, a lot of also anxiety and fogginess. And I just thought, I live in New York City, I'm overworked, maybe I'm partying too hard, maybe I'm, you know, all the different things that we say. And so once I received this diagnosis, having all of these different things, I literally had a laundry list going on. The doctor said, it sounds like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. And that was the first time that I'd even heard lupus in two years after ending up in almost every emergency room in New York City, I then started to spiral downwards very quickly. And I realized that this was such a critical life impending disease. I could not just go back to my normal way of functioning. I tried to resume work. I unfortunately had to take disability. I fought it with every tooth and nail possible. I was someone at the time, 31 years of age. I didn't think that disability applied to me, but I quickly found out that 
that was going to be my situation where my organs were compromised. I heard terms, um, lupus nephritis, pericarditis, vasculitis, all the itises. <laughs> they, were, they were giving me these names and prognoses and lymphatic issues and fibromyalgia. And I, I heard them saying, I have a very complicated case. There are extenuating conditions going on. I lost mobility for about five years while dealing with lupus. And when I say I lost mobility, it wasn't just, oh, you know, my feet are hurting me or my body's hurting me. I was convalescent and bedridden. I spent more time in the hospital or in a bed than I did actually living life. And it was debilitating. It was mentally emotional. It was financially taxing. That's a burden that we often don't speak about. I had no idea what myself, my husband, and my family members would be in for. The toll that it would take on my relationship the toll that it would even be on my mental health. Um, I had no idea that I would fall into that sense of depression, loneliness, grief, a lot of what people are experiencing right now, anxiety. I was left up to my own defenses. I did not have the toolkit and the information about lupus 10 years ago that I do now. And so I was taking over 15 medications at the very beginning of my diagnosis, hydrochloroquine being one of them. I did not know that it would be the standard protocol for my treatment 10 years later. So now when we're hearing that there's an interruption in access and that there's stockpiling and hoarding and that it's in limited supply for patients with autoimmune diseases, that to me has caused a lot of anxiety and also even concern because this has been a premium for my care. It's really helped with staving off some of the skin issues that I had that often led to infections, staph infections. It's really helped to also calm down a lot of the inflammatory issues that I've had. And I can say this with certainty, it's the one medication that my doctors never took me off of. I've been on chemo, I've been on steroid infusions, immunoglobin infusions, everything under the book. I've heard things as we've done as much as we possibly could do for you where my life was literally on the line. But hydrochloroquine was never ever removed from my treatment. And so I just want you to understand that for patients who rely upon this, it is seen in such a dire way. And we've also come to know it to be part of our care. And you know, during the time of my diagnosis, I've lost health, I've lost friends, I've lost stability, I've lost financial stability. I have a support system and not many people have that. I do have someone uh, and, and great doctors right now who understand what my value system is and they're able to see me as the whole patient. That was not always the case. Many patients don't have that voice. Many patients don't have the access to the Lupus Foundation of America like I do. So we have to be really careful. Now I'm understanding how we create their narrative and explaining to them who the patient is I heard people ask me if I was lazy. I heard people ask me if I had no will to go on. My will was taken from me, not on my own. I was someone who was college educated and had a great job and a great livelihood and friends and lupus impacted every single aspect of that. And so we are hoping that the perception changes of someone's will and hope and this disease, what this disease imposes on them. And I'm just really grateful that I have the opportunity to talk with you because we really get to shape an authentic narrative for someone like myself. This disaster has really brought out the best in some of us. And it's also reminded a lot of lupus patients that we're familiar with socially, social isolation and having to put up with our own defenses and all the different things that we need to do to protect ourselves and in our home. And it's also reminded us that we are a lot stronger than we know that we've been, um, but it's a great opportunity for us to raise the importance of awareness, the lack of treatment uh, plans that we have. Hydrochloroquine should not just be a, uh, a make or break for patients. It's also brought up a lot of the health disparities that many patients are unfortunately exposed to already. And this is one other thing that we're having them uh, to put on their plate. So I'm really happy that we're shining a light and highlighting patient stories, narratives, where 
multidimensional people. I'm a friend. I'm a wife. I'm not just a patient. I'm someone that has dreams and aspirations. And I'm really hopeful that the world lawmakers, pharmaceutical companies will see that and they'll take that into account when they're making decisions and that the story will be shaped on the different layers of a patient. Monique, thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm, I'm sure we're going to want to ask you some questions later. Um, very compelling, uh, and, and you've made it exceedingly clear in a personal way how much a crisis like this uh, can place people such as yourself at, at risk, um, not just from uh, you know, losing, but also from not being able to nest possibly get access to the treatments that you need. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Peacock. Can you, just speaking a little bit more broadly now, um, why are some populations more at risk for COVID-19 and who are those populations? So, um, we, you know, COVID-19 is a new disease, so we're still learning a lot about it. But um, what we know now is that there are certain populations that are at higher risk, like uh, older adults, so people who are 65 years and older, and people who have certain underlying conditions, especially if they're not well controlled. Um, we were hearing, you know, the Monique sometime, at the beginning, her, her um, condition was not as well controlled. And it, um, one of the things that we need to think about is that, um, having the chronic diseases under control is really important um, when we're facing a, a disease like COVID-19. So some of those conditions include chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, um, severe heart conditions, uh, people who are immunocompromised. So people that, and that could include people that are having cancer treatment, people who smoke regularly, uh, bone marrow or organ transplantation, um, immunodeficiencies, poorly controlled HIV or AIDS, and then people who are on um, uh, immune weakening medications like we heard about, sort of those medications or biologics that control uh, maybe an autoimmune um, disorder um, or those that are on prolonged uh, corticosteroids. There's a few other um, things that we know um, are put people at higher risk. Um, extreme obesity, so a BMI that's greater than 40, uh, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, especially people who have di uh, dialysis, and then people with liver disease. So it's a long list. We're still um, learning more about um, the disease, and so there may be other conditions that are added to that, but that's what we know right now. Um, just to, to a follow-up question to that, <clears throat> those are medical conditions, but in some of our earlier panels, we've also seen it's disproportionately affected people based upon uh, socioeconomic status, um, which of course has overlap having to do with marginalized communities, uh, race, uh, you know, sh stress, uh, obviously people that are worried about losing their jobs or have lost their jobs. Can, can you speak uh, to that at all? Yeah, there are, there are other groups as well. So as you mentioned, um, ra racial and ethnic minorities. And we had a report last, um, about a week ago that came out of CDC that showed that African Americans are uh, disproportionately um, affected. So both with more hospitalizations and then greater numbers of death, deaths. Um, people experiencing homelessness is another group that we know is at higher risk. Um, people with disabilities, and it's not necessarily that disability, but it's because um, they may either, we know that people with disabilities have higher numbers of underlying conditions. We also know that sometimes they don't have the access to care that they need, or they don't have the transportation or communication um, is not, you know, the communicating about um, what people need to do may not be being communicated in a way that reaches everybody. So for example, we may need to communicate things in American Sign Language or um, may need to provide information at a lower literacy level so that people can understand that. And so those are some of the other populations that we're really concerned about and, and need to make sure that they also have the information they need about COVID-19 and the access to care that they need. Um, for if they are to get sick. Dr. Abella, uh, you've been on the front lines in the ER. Can you give us a snapshot of who you're seeing in the ER uh, uh, with COVID-19? Yeah, it's, it's been a really challenging time. I was working today in our emergency department and just made it home in time for this. Um, we're seeing a broader swath of the population than, this, well, than we started to at the beginning of all this. And what I mean to say, Early in this pandemic, uh, we saw people who um, 
were traveling, people were coming from abroad. Uh, so it was, it was sort of a narrower band of people. It was either the college kids coming back from Europe or business travelers. Uh, uh, we saw a few folks from cruise ships. Um, but now it's really spread throughout the population and, and we're seeing it affecting everybody. I mean, it's endemic. And, and I really uh, agree wholeheartedly with some of the comments I just made about um, disparities and, and um, so sort of socioeconomic impacts. It's now it's really reaching out to the, the needy in our society. Um, we're seeing folks from homeless shelters. Um, we're seeing people from, um, uh, from skilled nursing facilities. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really sort of tragic at multiple levels. Not only is the disease tragic, um, but it's reaching people who really don't have the resources, don't have the means, don't have the connections to get care. Uh, so for example, one of the big uh, stories we're hearing often, um, I heard it today, is people couldn't get tested, so they showed up at the ER. Um, testing is really limited right now. Um, it's largely something where you have to have the know, uh, know it all, wherewithal to find it or insurance to allow you to get it. So for people who are underinsured or uninsured who aren't savvy with how the healthcare system works, they can't get tested. And so when they get sick, they get scared. They don't know if it's COVID and they come to our ER. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's really challenging. And uh, 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 for the folks who don't have the infrastructural resources, say people who are homeless, it's hard to know what to do with them because what does quarantine mean if you don't have a stable home environment or you don't have a place to go? So those are some thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Kostin Bader. Um, pulling it back to lupus for a moment, can you talk to us uh, with a little more detail in terms of uh, what lupus is from a medical perspective? Sure, so I am a lupus doctor, so I take care of a lot of lupus patients. And I can tell you that lupus is a very serious and very complicated autoimmune disease. So as Monique was explaining, the body doesn't recognize um, just external invaders and, and uh, viruses and bacterial infections and, and other things, but it recognizes itself as foreign and you get an autoimmune response. And lupus is actually like the quintessential autoimmune disease because it can attack any organ system. So antibodies are formed, and these autoantibodies can attack the kidneys, the brain, the heart, the blood cells, um, the joints are involved, rashes, and no two patients are the same. It's very complicated. There are myriad forms of lupus, um, and it's very difficult to recognize because it's, uh, well, there are probably up to one and a half million people who have lupus of some sort in the country, but it's so different and so heterogeneous that it's often hard for physicians to recognize it. Fatigue and fevers and lymph node swelling and mouth sores could be so many different things. So it takes a while to get diagnosed and then it can have a lot of different complications um, over one's lifetime. Um, and so just to tell you the demographic of who's most affected by um, by lupus, it does tend to be people in the prime of life. So 15, age 15 to 40 is the peak incidence. It can happen at any age, but it does happen to be in those years where we see the most cases. And it's mostly women, about nine out of 10 cases during that time are women. And then for unknown reasons, we also see um, very large health disparities. It's mainly not people of European descent, but African descent especially, but also Asian descent, Hispanic and, um, and Native Americans in this country. So all non-European um, descent people. And there's probably a combination of both genetic and environmental factors that um, make that true. So it's, you know, Monique is, is a typical case in that the complexity of her case and also the demographics. So, uh, I mean, we, we've been hearing a lot that people who are immune compromised uh, you know, are, are, are at particular or high risk when it comes to COVID-19. But it sounds like with lupus, uh, I mean, that's a, it's a very high risk group given the fact that their bodies are having so much difficulty fighting off any numerous other types of invaders at the same time. True, and um, so we don't know really, we don't, because this is, as um, Dr. Peacock just said, this is such a new virus. We don't have a lot of experience with lupus patients and COVID-19. And there have been stories out there that maybe lupus patients are protected. Maybe lupus patients don't get COVID-19. And we, that is probably not true. I think Dr. Bell and I have probably both seen lupus patients get this disease. There's a, um, an international registry now of rheumatology patients um, 
there and there are plenty of lupus patients in it who do have COVID-19. And they probably are at increased risk for a lot of the reasons that Dr. Peacock mentioned, um, especially these complicated, severe cases of lupus have to be treated with immunosuppression. So these are broad ranging. We know that high dose glucocorticoids, as we mentioned, so prednisone is a risk factor for getting worse COVID, um, getting more COVID and getting worse COVID. And then the other immunosuppressive medications we, we use make uh, people at high risk as well. Have you or in uh Dr. Abella, you may have as well seen uh, directly any, any lupus patients with COVID? So I, I won't give you details, but we do have lupus patients in the hospital at the Brigham Women's Hospital with, with uh, COVID, yes. Um, and and I've, I've also seen uh, lupus patients with COVID. So, um, but it's, it's complicated. You know, uh, one of the questions everyone asks, and we may get to this a little later, is, well, if that's so, can, how do we know that hydroxychloroquine prevents COVID? And I think the, the lupus experience is a complicated one because these patients are on many medicines and they have a variety of diseases. Diseases. So, you know, looking at the population of people with lupus doesn't give us a direct answer of what hydroxychloroquine does or doesn't do uh, to prevent it. Um, um, as Dr. Cosbader pointed out, uh, lupus patients are, are complicated. They have a lot going on. There are a lot of medicines. Their diseases come in different flavors. And in general, they are more susceptible to immune attacks from um, infections. Um, what can you? Perhaps this is best directed at you, Dr. Kostenbader, but uh, what does hydroxychloroquine, everyone says it different, it seems. Hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine yeah. So, yeah, so we should get to what, what, that, what that what is. Does, yeah. you know, what, does it, what is it and what does it do? Uh, Who knew uh, it was going to be right in the middle of, of COVID-19, right? <laughs> um, so uh, hydroxychloroquine, which is a, a drug that I am very familiar with for many years because it really is the staple drug that we use for lupus. Um, it's an anti-malarial drug at origin, and then in the 1950s, 60s, they figured out that it worked um, as a disease-stabilizing type of medication in autoimmune conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we like it a lot in rheumatology for lupus, and we think that we should prescribe it for everyone who has even a suspicion of lupus. It's proven in lupus. Um, and we prescribe it as soon as we're even thinking about an autoimmune disease like lupus, and we want people to stay on it for as long as possible. And of our medications, it's relatively non-toxic, but that's in an armamentarium of medications that includes high-dose steroids and many immunosuppressive medications. So um, we started right away. It actually works probably, we don't exactly know. It would be nice if we knew exactly how it worked and then we could make a medication that didn't have any side effect and did exactly what it does. But it probably works um, to, in the uh, toll-like receptors on the, in cells, in the uptake of foreign nucleic acids, RNA and DNA, and then inside the cell, um, in terms of inside the lysosomes and endosomes, mounting the immune response. So it downregulates that immune response. So it's possible that it has a role in COVID as well. We don't know exactly what it's doing in lupus, but we know it's disease stabilizing. We tell people when we start it, we'll start it today. You're not gonna feel any different tomorrow. You'll take it for two or three months before you see that it's disease stabilizing. It prevents the flares of the disease because another thing I didn't say about lupus is it has these periods of exacerbation and flares where there's fevers and fatigue and joint pains and everything goes awry. And then we, we scramble and we get it under control and then it's under better control for a while. And we're trying to stabilize that and prevent the flares. And so uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, the trade name is Plaquenil, um, is very good at stabilizing disease and preventing the flares. It's good for rashes, it's good for joint um, pains. Uh, and a lot of the, the symptoms of, of lupus. So we want all of our patients to stay on it for as long as possible. And so an interruption in the supply of Plaquenil, of, of hydroxychloroquine, could be very scary for our, our patients because there are trials that show if you take people off of their hydroxychloroquine, they will have a flare. Not tomorrow because it has a long half-life, but within a couple months. And those are, are randomized controlled trials um, that prove it really does work in, in uh, lupus. So, Dr. Peacock, we, we've heard a bit uh, over the last few weeks about hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment for COVID. Um, but what do we actually know? Uh, what research has been done or not been done? Um, from the CDC standpoint, like what, 
what, what can we say any, anything definitive about it? Um, you know, or, or are, is it just too early to know? I mean, are, are there people doing experiments as we speak? So and, um, right now we don't have any drugs or therapeutics that are approved by the US Food and Drug Administration to prevent or treat COVID-19. So um, when people are being treated in the hospital, it's usually because uh, with supportive care. So it's things like using supplemental oxygen or um, using things um, sort of to support respiratory failure or septic shock or multi-organ failure. And I that um, Dr. Abella can probably talk to this even better than, than me. Um, but we also know that the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are under investigation in clinical trials. So they're using them for pre-exposure and po post-exposure prophylaxis for, for um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual virus that causes COVID-19 um, for patients that have a range of symptoms, so mild, moderate, and severe. So there's more information that you can read about um, at clinicaltrials.gov. And then I think uh, Dr. Abella can also tell us a lot more about um, what they're doing related to trials. Um. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Bella. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I was just going to follow up on that. Yeah, so there are a number of trials underway in the United States um, for using hydroxychloroquine and, and various strategies for COVID. Uh, I'm involved in, in a set of those trials at, at University of Pennsylvania. Two of them are treatment trials where we're treating patients with COVID with hydroxychloroquine. And one is a prevention trial where we're seeing if taking a dose of hydroxychloroquine can prevent healthcare workers under heavy exposure uh, from getting it. Now, um, I'm uh, an emergency physician and a clinical trials expert. I'm not a hydroxychloroquine expert. I, do, I, do I think it'll work? I honestly don't know. Um, but I was approached by people at Penn who are experts who feel there's a fighting chance it may work. Um, I think the one thing I would say is that we don't know and, and we need to subject it to, to rigorous clinical trials. Um, it's just as possible we will find a negative answer that it doesn't work. But the reason why we need to do this is, and I'm sure all of you on, on the call uh, have seen this with your own eyes, in, in the media, um, in, 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 the, in the press and politicians, there's been a lot of talk of this therapy or that therapy working, or it's a miracle cure, you should all take this. And that sort of talk is very damaging and very dangerous. It's dangerous to the public because we don't know what works or doesn't work. And, and I feel very bad for lupus patients who are now having a really tough time in some cases getting hold of drugs that are very important for them um, because they're sort of like a gold rush, a frenzy to get all of these medicines. So in a way, I'd almost be as happy to show that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work because then I can protect lupus patients and say, hey, everybody, settle down. It doesn't work. Let's move on to the next drug. So, um, but, but we can only know this through rigorous randomized trials that we're trying to conduct. Well, I actually want to jump straight to a question from one of our audience members because it speaks to, to what you just mentioned. Um, and, and I'm just going to read it aloud. Uh, uh, and this person writes, as a lupus patient for the last 19 years, hydroxychloroquine has been a consistent part of my treatment. Since mid-March, I've had a very uh, hard time getting my normal amount of the drug, only getting two weeks work, uh, sorry, there's a few typos, only getting two weeks worth of a supply on March 23rd. When I came to refill my prescription, I was told I have gotten my annual allocation of the drug, which is 30 pills in a rolling 365 day calendar. I have the uh, patience uh, and will to fight with the insurance company, uh, which after 16 calls, three emails, and a follow-up with my rheumatologist, I was able to get an exemption for this entire year. My question for the Lupus Foundation is, are they working actively to advocate for lupus patients so they do not need to go through the steps I did, uh, I did to in order to get my medication? Yes, so uh, to, that is a very good question and brings up the very big problem we have, yes. Um, so to back up uh, in terms of the evidence that hydroxychloroquine actually does anything for COVID, um, we are grasping at straws. We don't have anything, as Dr. Peacock said. So there are lots of medications under investigation, but hydroxychloroquine hit the headlines because of some early studies that were um, very, um, Really, some of the ones out of France were very poorly conducted, honestly. They were open label, they moved people, they ignored people who died or went to the ICU. It was really, I mean, we're trying to get the science done as quickly as possible. 
but we've not had really rigorous big clinical trials or rigorous peer review. Things are being published all the time directly online now without peer review. And there are also now more and more scary signals about hydroxychloroquine. There was a trial yeah, of chloroquine in um, Brazil that was uh, shut down because of fatal heart arrhythmias. So these medications are not without side effects. We use them in rheumatology all the time. We love them for our lupus patients and we know how to use them. But, but in sick COVID patients, they actually could have side effects. There's another trial in France that has the same safety signal. And so now I think in terms of the balance of is this medication actually going to prevent or, or help COVID patients or not? I'm thinking, well, I don't know. So we still don't have, we're still at that equipoise position, but we don't have the big trials. But meanwhile, yes, there's been this frenzy, um, there have been many presidential tweets and announcement that there might not be any uh, downside to taking it, but clearly there would be a downside. And that clearly there's a downside for lupus patients because there's a national shortage now. So people go to refill, um, the pharmacies are out, and the Lupus Foundation has, and the American College of Rheumatology have been working with both of them. We've been working furiously behind the scenes. Um, together, we put together a big letter to the coronavirus uh, tax task force and uh, Vice President Pence, all of the, um, the senators and uh, House of Representatives, everyone in government, all of their staffers, all the 50 governors, all of their staffers, all the state pharmacy boards, Etc. We are making a lot, a lot of noise, and we have had a little bit of movement. And now, um, well, what, a couple of things. Uh, a lot of big pharmacies have now pledged doses of hydroxychloroquine, mainly for COVID. Um, but at least, you know, the, uh, the pharmacies or and the um, manufacturers are pledging that they will donate uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, you know, a certain number of doses for the investigation. That should help the supply chain a little bit. Um, and the pharmacies are, it, it's been a little bit harder for our patients to get their um, medications, but I think we're seeing some loosening up. There still are big shortages, especially in New York, in areas where there is a lot of, of, of COVID, it's actually the hardest to get um, hydroxychloroquine. So patients have a lot of problems. We are working on it. Who, is, who is actually buying up all this hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine I mean, I am assuming I, as an average citizen, can't just walk into the pharmacy. Right. And buy you need a prescription. So unfortunately, so. with the beginning of the hysteria and the tweets and everything, it had to be physicians. You, ha you have to write a prescription for it. But there were probably a lot of unscrupulous physicians thinking, as the president said, there may be no downside. So I don't I put, you know, all of my patients, all of my friends, all of their friends, all of my family, anybody I know on hydroxychloroquine, there can't be any downside. But you can see, this is a medication that already was in short supply. We've already had uh, shortages of hydroxychloroquine in the past, um, many times because it's mainly generic. Um, and so often we just have a short supply and then everybody's scrambling and putting everybody they know on it. And then we have a big national shortage and a big problem. Along the same lines, uh, another question that's come in, uh, and forgive me, is, is what is, do you know what SLE stands for? That's systemic lupus erythematosus. That's the okay. long form of lupus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this, this may be similar to the last question, but physicians are having a difficult time advocating for SLE patients. For example, many patients are being refused medication with a prescription when a pharmacy actually has the medication. Do you have any information to share to bridge the communication divide? Yeah, this is a big problem. So I've, I've never had to fill out prior authorizations and give my medical records and labs and call the pharmacy five times to get prescriptions for two weeks supply of hydroxychloroquine for my patients before, but that's what we're in. So um, the Lupus Foundation does have information on their website about what patients should do. And basically, as the first um, question asker, asker said, you need to start making a lot of noise. You need to go to your doctor, you need to go to the LFA, try other pharmacies, try mail away pharmacies. Um, unfortunately, it's the educated patients who um, you know, are, have, are medically savvy who know how to do this. They, and then sometimes you have to pay without insurance because you have to get it from some other distributor who your insurance won't cover. Um, so it's a, it's a big problem. Hopefully your physician can um, help you. Um, we know it has a, ha a long half-life. I've been telling some of my patients, well, start taking, you know, one every other day because I don't know if you'll be able to refill on time. And we shouldn't have to go through this. It's, it's scary thinking that the prescriptions are going to run out. 
and we're doing our best. There, there are some resources on the LFA website about some pharmacy chains that do have it still, um, how you can possibly work with them and work with your insurance to, to get it, but your physician will have to jump through hoops, et cetera. Thank you. By the way, for our audience, just so you know, um, a lot of the resources that people are mentioning, anytime someone mentions an organization or a website, all of that is being put in the chat uh, box. So if you click on, on the chat uh, tab at the very bottom of your screen, uh, you'll have access to all those resources. And of course, uh, Hollywood and Health and Society will make those available elsewhere uh, as well. Monique, if, if you had any issues in securing the amount of hydroxychloroquine that you need, Oh. So I, I can definitely attest to the questions and the concern because I found myself in this very same situation. I live in New York City. I specifically live in Brooklyn. And it's almost become like a black market that patients have had to go on to act to find these medications. When my doctor, we thought we were getting ahead of it. We thought that by him putting in a three-month supply in the beginning of March, that that would stave off the issue, but um, I was only provided a 30 day supply. And, you know, Dr. Carson Bader said it, you know, perfectly. I, even the most well informed patient sometimes is finding themselves in these situations. I, right now, I'm working with the pharmacy in California so that I can get the medication. And one of the issues that we're, we're also seeing, they might take insurance, but then you have to pay for the shipping and handling, you have to wait for it. Um, there are also many pharmacies where I'm living in New York City and Brooklyn that just are just completely overwhelmed. So there's an issue of health equity as well for patients who are already disenfranchised and disproportionately affected. There's another financial component that they now have to take into effect. And I've been uh, experiencing this as I've been calling and calling and calling and being told about the level of priority. I would, I would like to think that I'm a priority. Uh, well, so here, here's a question that I think tries to look at all of this with the glass half full mentality. Um, and, and you can tell us whether it's potentially half full or half empty. Um, can you, and so I open this up to everyone, comment on how this pandemic could pave uh, for better medical access for as well as representation of lupus patients and their needs. So I guess the gist of the question is, um, be because of the unfortunate run on hydroxychloroquine uh, and the risk that it puts, uh, that it poses to, to lupus patients, um, is there an opportunity insofar as maybe we're paying a little more attention to lupus patients out of necessity that then could lead to better treatment and representation down the line. Um, is, is, that, is that too hopeful or uh, is that something that we could maybe work towards? I suppose this panel is a, a little bit of a drop in that river. Can I That's just say I as a patient? Say. Go ahead, Monique. Uh, just quickly as a patient, I, I do want to just state that we are not looking to jeopardize anyone's health. So the fact that there is a race to find a vaccination and a cure and treatments, it gives us hope because maybe there's an opportunity to repurpose some of the medication. We just want to make sure that we're also in consideration as well. And so I think that that's a really great question. It just opens up the, op the um, challenges and getting better research better treatments, that's really all we want. We don't want to have so many side effects. But if we do have more um, opportunities and access, it just gives us better options to work with. Dr. Kostenbader, I believe you were going to say something. I think or? Dr. Bigeko had something to say too. But I would just say that I think that would be a lovely thought. That It's nice to, that people are thinking about lupus patients because they really are in, you know, in ground zero of this, unfortunately. Um, who knew that lupus and hydroxychloroquine, well, who knew that COVID was coming, but then that, we, that, the, that lupus would be right in the center of the storm. Um, and um, hopefully we can look back and say, well, we did manage to get more resources for our patients because as Monique said many times, a lot of our patients are the most vulnerable, the most medically underserved, and it's really unfair that they are the people not able to get their medication now. I mean, there's a lot of things that are very unfair about this pandemic, you know, and the, and the populations that's striking and the people that's hitting the hardest. And I was just 
say, um, you know, the, the stories and, and, and he, hearing this and hearing stories about this maybe does create that awareness. Um, also, you know, at the, at the CDC, we try to put the data that we have out there. So when we can describe how many people are being hospitalized or who's being hospitalized or who's dying, um, who's getting better, those types of things, I think that creates a conversation in our world that hopefully draws attention to differences in care and things like that. And so um, people, one thing that, that I do pretty regularly is I go to the CDC website to look, they, we put new data up there every day. Um, and I think it's, it, hopefully it brings awareness to um, what's going on in our world with COVID-19, but with the, the greater um, sort of medical field and medical conditions. Great. Um, so this question, I think it's for both Dr. Abella and Dr. Peacock. Um, when will the results of the trials for hydroxychloroquine be known? Uh, and so, I, I, I mean, there's the, the, there's the trial that you're doing, that you're conducting yourself, Dr. Abella, but Dr. Peacock, I'm sure there's others as well. Uh, and then the follow-up to that is what happens if the medication does work for COVID-19? Will the pharmaceutical companies manufacture more so that lupus patients get the medication too? Why don't we start with you, Dr. Abella? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, you know, uh, of course, everyone who runs a clinical trial wants it to be over as quick as possible to get the results out as quick as possible. But these things take time. They're, they're hard. Uh, technically, this is a really tough disease to study. Uh, for example, patients are contagious. So you can't simple things. You can't have them sign sheets of paper to consent and then pick up those sheets of paper. So it has to be these phone electronic consent processes. It, it's very technically difficult to study. So we think it'll at least be months um, before we start getting some of the results from some of these trials. Um, much like the vaccine trials, everyone wants it done tomorrow, and I want it done tomorrow. But good science takes time. You can't rush it. Um, when you rush these things, you get some of the results that uh, uh, were referred to where, you know, uh, uh, people and went into a frenzy because of very poorly done trials. So it takes time. So it may take a minimum of three to six months before we get results. Dr. Peacock, anything to add to that? Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. I think that was said really well. <laughs> okay, great. Um, to your oh, uh, I was going to say to your second question, you know, what if, um, you know, what if they work? You know, what, 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 what was going to happen? Um, I think this really speaks to one of the major challenges that our whole healthcare system has, which is very poor central coordination and planning, you know, and, and I, I apologize, this is going to sound vaguely political here, but we have, a, we have a system that where the incentives are mostly financial and the drivers are mostly financial. And so pharmaceutical companies do what they do to make profits and, and they can't be blamed. That's the system in which they inhabit. That's, that's what they do. And, and so they go where the profits are. And, and what this means is that drugs that are generic are very, we're very much held to the whims of who's willing to do it and how much. There, there's not sort of a good central planning system that says, okay, we're going to stockpile this much or we're going to direct pharmaceutical companies with a carrot and a stick to say, if you make this, then you get these other incentives. You know, these, these structures are very poorly developed. So I fear that if these trials are successful, there's going to be a feeding frenzy for these drugs. Um, uh, there's a limited supply. So of course, the price is going to skyrocket. Um, and, and then we're going to have a lot of complex um, governmental and political conversations about what to do about a limited resource um, that is really in a free market of sorts uh, for pricing. Uh, Dr. Peacock, does the Defense Production Act uh, apply to pharmaceutical companies um, in a time of crisis? Can the federal government simply tell a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company they have to make X drug and sell it at X price? You know, I'm actually, I'm not familiar with, with the, the um, rules under that. Um, I do know that um, there are some provisions um, in, uh, in the um, strategic national stockpile. So there is some of this medicine in the strategic national stockpile that healthcare providers can um, request to, to use on an emergency use authorization in order to um, uh, treat, treat patients. Um, but I actually, I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, I, I have one more question I'm going to read aloud, and then I want to steer the conversation a little bit towards storytelling, because this is, uh, we, we are 
the Writers Guild of America, after all, and Hollywood Health and Society's um, expressed aim is to help storytellers be informed about the stories that they want to tell. So I want to make sure that we devote a little bit of time to that. Um, this last question I have, uh, not on that topic, is, and I'm going to I'm going to butcher some medical terms here. Um, I have uh, also heard about using uh, hydrochloroquine with zithromycin. Uh, any information about this combination? I don't know who to direct that to. I, happy I was going to say, I'll turn yeah. it to Dr. Abella, but I oh. think there's lots of different th different combinations that people are trying. So zithromycin is actually a pretty common uh, medication that we use. Um, people call it a Z-Pack sometimes. And, um, but I think there's lots of different things people are trying because this is a disease that we don't know a lot about. Um, but turn it to, to Dr. Bella or Dr. Kostenbader. Yeah, so, so azithromycin is a common antibiotic. Many people have used it, and it's, it's a useful antibiotic for bacterial infections. We have no idea if it has any value in any viral infections. It probably doesn't, but there's been some idea that it might help in COVID. Um, that is on very thin, thin reads. I, I suspect it's sort of semi-made up. And, and just today, I think, um, Fauci had an advisory board say that they would um, recommend against using this for mycin in combination with hydroxychloroquine because the two in combination actually are dangerous. Uh, they increase the risk of heart arrhythmias, sometimes lethal heart arrhythmias. So we actually in our trial ask everyone, are you going to zithromycin? And we won't let someone into the trial if they are taking it because we think it's this dangerous combo to start someone on this medicine on azithromycin. I'd be curious from our lupus expert what uh, uh, when when your patients are in Plaquenil and they have an infection that needs antibiotics, do you avoid azithromycin? I'm, I'm curious. I, I don't know. Um, the, interestingly, we are not really that attuned to this issue. We put everybody on Plaquenil. We don't usually hold it, but I don't think um, our patients are as um, critically ill in intensive care units, et cetera, uh, at the time, and they don't have the same underlying heart disease. We don't see that much, but there is a, um, a specific heart rhythm called, called torsade de plant, which is fatal heart rhythm, which comes about because of the change in the EKG and the uh, prolongation. Um, so yes, now we don't use it, but it's amazing how fast this is moving because until just about yesterday, the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin was the standard regimen at my hospital. That based on very, very thin um, evidence for both medications, it's the only thing besides supportive oxygen and ventilation we had to off offer. So now it looks like that, that combination is actually risky um, and because of studies in Brazil and, and in after a recent VA study um, showing that there are increased uh, arrhythmias and deaths. So it, this is evolving quickly. And there, I think the other thing is that the clinicaltrials.gov, the, the day before yesterday or something, there were 300 COVID trials going on in the country. So there are a lot of them. So you know, everybody's going to try to get results as soon as possible. And as you said, it's difficult, but hopefully we'll have results in the next few months. And hopefully very high quality, good results with real blinding and real randomization and large numbers um, so that we can, we can really address the question. Speaking of, and I guess I lied because I have one more question before we get to stories telling, but Kate reminded me that uh, there was a, a recent study, which I think came out, it was reported on yesterday or today, uh, I think a VA study, like 368 patients that said HCQ. Wow, that's a lot easier. HCQ. I'm going to switch. Yeah, exactly. That's easy. Uh, does not work. Uh, um, <clears throat> what's the difference? Now, that's not three or six months away. That's someone... That that's being reported now is that is that just a very small sample size like is that a different type of trial yeah, it's or? a pretty big sample size but it's retrospective it was not randomized it was a it was a review of what had happened and the patients took hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin i think and that's the combination that's, that's toxic um, and they did have a higher death rate um, but it was um, not randomized so the, probably the sickest patients got that combination and so there's a lot of issues with you know not being really blinded. It wasn't, you know, randomized, so this person got this, and so that both groups look very similar. So, but it is a retrospective analysis that shows us that it's, it's not helping, so that may have informed the new, um, new changes. So. Great, thank you. So let's shift gears a little bit to storytelling, and, and uh, I, I want to try to cover as much ground as we can in our sort of last, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, you know, I, 
just off the top of my head, I can think of a lot of different angles that how, how this conversation could lead to compelling stories or be folded into stories that people are working on. I mean, obviously, um, Monique, your story, which is, which is personal and moving and, you know, where you're dealing with uh, a lot of real life drama um, all the time. And, you know, there's uh, everything from depression, despair to hope and resilience. Um, so, so that's the whole human story right there. But then also to, to our doctors, um, I, you know, stories in, in terms of, you know, how the medical and scientific community, um, the challenges they face, uh, and, and, you know, you know, if, if all storytelling is conflict, I'm thinking about maybe some of the conflicts that you guys have to deal either on a small or a big scale and also just personal stories. I mean, you know, Dr. Bella, I imagine being in an ER room every day um, or almost every day um, as a human being uh, takes its own toll. Uh, and, you're, and you're seeing people go truly through life and death scenarios, um, you know, on a constant basis. So, uh, you know, I, I just throw that all up as sort of fodder for conversation, but I'm hoping that we can just kind of shift into discussion about storytelling. Monique, let, let's start with you, though. Um, I mean, you know, and, and don't feel like you just got to speak about lupus, but, um, but I imagine that lupus is something that probably hasn't been represented on screen um, as much as it should be if there's over a million people in this country that suffer from one form of it or another. Right. Um, you know, and I think it's also the type of person that's represented with the disease because, um, as we said, that it's so heterogeneous and that this disease affected me when I was, you know, 30 years old, but I'm now a woman 41 years old. And so there are so many different individuals, whether there's there are children. And then I also always talk about the story from the caretaker or care partner. And that's also so instrumental because sometimes their human side gets lost in the process. And I could never write my, my own husband's story, but I always say, I wish that sometimes that he would be, you know, included or given a voice in the decision making a lot more because that shapes how we live our livelihood. Um, lupus has unfortunately dominated every aspect of my life. And sometimes when I come into a room, it can be a bit deceptive because I might not look like someone dealing with a debilitating disease. But I promise you, Bo, um, this person could change. It's like Fiona, you know, two weeks from now, you might see a different person, swollen, maybe no hair is on my head. And you're like, what just happened? So it leads to a different conversation about what's happening with the disease and the diagnosis. The story of lupus changes every day. It's like you're recalibrating um, in your car. And so I think that's important when we do share stories about lupus to share the different layers, the changes, um, just from even modality, whether you're a wife, you're a family member, your post-lupus life, your pre-lupus life. Well, I imagine, I mean, your, your husband sounds fantastic and you seem like such an optimistic, joyful person. I am uh, now. I wasn't always yeah. this way. Uh, but I, but I, I, imagine, I imagine it must put incredible stresses on home life. Um, you know, you could have the greatest spouse in the world, but everyone has their limits. And I mean, it's taking a, has a ripple effect, I imagine. Sure. Um, I mean, this has been challenging to us coming into a marriage, this was put on his plate. And so he had to assume full financial responsibility. You know, when we were engaged, there were two individuals with two incomes and two homes, and this fell on his lap. And insurance companies oftentimes do not understand the complexity of lupus. So he has to fight with them. I have to fight with them. We get approved, we get denied. He has a lot of stress on his job. He works in financial services. So he deals with that for about 10 hours a day. And oftentimes he would not know what he was coming home to. It's interesting now that we're quarantined together we've had a really interesting life where he's had to make so much concessions for me already and his passions and his dreams. You know, coming into a marriage, you forgo a lot of that, but he's had to abandon that in so many different ways. And we're really rediscovering each other right now. I'm getting to see, you know, he has a really demanding job and I couldn't imagine what that's been like dealing with someone who's facing death 
or even just at having an issue with getting medication and seeing now how he's been able to switch roles and be so loving and so kind and so approachable. But that's not everyone's case. I've never had to deal with my husband saying, I'm leaving you or I don't want to come home. Um, and so it's an interesting dynamics when you, when you think about you know, your mental health, your sexual health, your financial health, and having kids. Can we have kids? Okay, it's 10 years later, we still haven't had kids. All these things have come into play and my husband has, he's really been really accepting and understanding of it. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Kostin Bader, um, staying on lupus for a moment, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking myself, like if I wanted to have a character in a movie that I was writing, uh, you know, who has lupus. Um, are there, I mean, first of all, I would assume that there's probably many people in our lives that may have lupus that we don't know about it because they're able to, I mean, they, they may suffer quite a bit, but they're able to mask it or have chosen not to share it. And they're, you know, but for whatever reasons, they, they haven't shared it, but they're living fully productive lives. So, um, you know, I, it's, I mean, I, I was astounded to hear the statistic that uh, over a million people, I mean, that's, that's a third of a percent. That's a lot of people. Um, uh, but True. yeah, so, so there see, are a lot of aspects of, also, of lupus. Yeah, and, and also, like, if there are any um, stereotypes or myths or anything that people should avoid or make sure that they don't, they don't get wrong. Yeah, I think there are a lot of interesting or uh, unique aspects to lupus. One, um, Monique already, and plus that was a very powerful story. I think that that's a lovely story. Of how husband is so supportive. I can't beat that. Um, but uh, thinking about how lupus is unique, I think as Monique um, alluded to, that it's often misdiagnosed or it takes a long time to get diagnosed. Like there was a, a long time ago, the Lupus Foundation did a study and patients reported on average it was about six years from their earliest symptoms until they got they actually got the diagnosis. Hopefully that's not true in my clinic, but there are lots of people who come in and you just can't tell them if they have lupus. It can be a chameleon. It can look like a lot of other diseases for a long time. It can look like a lot of infectious diseases. Um, it can look like depression. It can look like you know, a lot of different things. So there's this delay in diagnosis and then getting the right care and the access to care is a huge issue, issue for lupus patients. Um, I think that everybody's story is different with lupus as well. There are people who have um, very mild lupus and just rashes and um, and some joint pains. And then there are people who lose their kidneys, who, um, you know, have big strokes at early ages and, and really horrible, horrible. It's actually, lupus is one of the top, I think it is the number one cause of autoimmune death in women. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a very, very severe disease. With that being said, we have a lot of outreach events, even in my clinic and at the Bergen Women's Hospital, where we have a big lupus population. And one of my patients said to me once at, at one of our events, I couldn't believe it. She said, I've and I've, I've known her for years, maybe 12 years she's had lupus. She said, I've never met anybody else with lupus. I was thinking, how is that possible? You know, and she works and she has horrible lupus. She'd had a stroke. She'd had everything. And I said, how is that possible? You sit in the waiting room all the time. Aren't you talking to people? But but no, she didn't. So she, you know, it was one of the first times that she connected and we had an event about how do you tell other people that you have lupus? And people are very different about it. Some people, you know, how do you tell work about that you have lupus? Are you going to lose your job? How do you tell your friends who've known you before lupus and then after lupus? How do you tell your family members who, you know, et cetera. So everybody comes to it from a different place. The wife of a good friend of mine who I've known for years saw that I had tweeted about uh, this event and texted me this evening to say, oh, I can't tune in, but I'm so glad you're doing this. I've had lupus uh, since 1996. Uh, and, you know, and, and this is a really important topic. And I had no idea. Never, you were never shocked. Yeah. yeah, I mean, incredibly active person. She runs a, a, a playwriting retreat upstate, you know, is one of the most active and ambitious people I know. And so, um, I mean, now it puts, I think back of all the times we've interacted and that what she might have been going through in that moment that she wasn't necessarily sharing with others. Um, you know, we're, we're getting near the end here, but I wanna make sure that we uh, turn it to Dr. Bell and Dr. Peacock, just in terms of storytelling um, from your own perspectives. I mean, I, I guess Dr. Abella, um, We'll, we'll finish with you because you, you, you can talk about the ER or anything you want. But Dr. Peacock, I mean, as someone who's looking at the big picture often um, in terms of, you know, the, the challenges that, uh, you know, our country and the world is facing when it comes to, 
um, you know, infectious disease and being prepared and, you know, or, or, or just as a viewer, someone who watches mm -hmm. television and film and says, I would like to see more of X, Y, or Z. Um, you have anything to share with our storytellers? With well, you know, I think what's, what worries me a, a lot about, so we, we make a, a lot of recommendations for things um, for people to do, and we're trying to make those recommendations um, to protect people and to, to save as many lives as possible. But one of the things that I think I've worried about a lot is that we've recommended that people with underlying conditions or people who are older adults or um, people that are vulnerable for some reason, you know, self-isolate. So stay, uh, you know, on their own or, um, and stay away from people so they don't come into contact with that, the, with COVID-19. Um, in particular, we've said, you know, if you live in a nursing home um, or a long-term care facility, you can't have any visitors. You need to work, close the doors and only let the healthcare providers in. Um, because we think that's going to keep you um, safe from this real, this disease we don't know a lot about. Um, and I just worry long term what that is doing. And I think we need to think of really creative ways to stay socially connected when we are trying to protect people by keeping them isolated. But, but that is also really hard. Um, and so that's something that I think is important to explore in our narrative. I guarantee you at all the film festivals in 2022, there's going to be a lot of indie movies about, you know, they just got divorced, but he hasn't moved out yet. Oops, <laughs> stay at home. Now they're stuck together for the next, you know. <laughs> so yeah. we'll be, I mean, we'll be exploring this story of what it means to shelter in place and the stresses it puts on us, both right. tragic and comic, I think for years to come. Dr. Abella, um, well, I mean, anything you want to talk about. I mean, obviously, you have a perspective of the front lines. You've seen the tolls taken on people that are sick. You've seen the tolls taken on your colleagues. You've experienced that toll probably yourself. But there may be other things that are important, you think, for us to think about as storytellers. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many stories that I could dwell on in the ER. Um, uh, certainly, I could tell stories of colleagues um, who have gotten sick. Um, uh, I know several people who have died um, of COVID, um, uh, including a nurse manager I was friends with at a, a regional ER that I worked at. Um, so that's hard. Um, and, and that's something that we didn't expect. I could tell stories of patients um, who have come through very sick, patients I've intubated, patients I've told their families on the phone that they had died because we don't allow visitors back now anymore. So there's so many things I could tell. Um, I, I think one thing that's worth um, talking about in, in that may be less explored is, is the fact that um, this is a, a, a strange pandemic in a number of ways. One of the ways it's strange is that we really have a lack of information and a lack of coordinated, clear information from the top. And, and I don't mean that to impugn any one individual, although uh, I, there are many to impugn. Um, but, but one of the main lessons of public health is clear and consistent communication, even if it's bad news. I just so people know what's going on and they know how to react. And so we have so many situations of patients who really are scared. They have no idea what to do. They have no idea where to turn. Um, and, and they're getting the wrong information. Um, you know, there are uh, uh, patients who um, thought because they tested negative that they don't have it. Um, and even though they were feeling sickly, um, they could then do whatever they want with their family or friends because they were negative. Um, one of the things that's not been clearly communicated is a lot of people have a negative test before they have a positive test several days later. And so we have many tragic cases of people who tested negative, decided they could then be social, treat that as a carte blanche to do whatever they wanted to do, and then came back mortally ill or worse, family members with them um, significantly ill. So I think what we have here is a disease that no one really completely understands. Um, and, what we, and what we do know is not being well shared and spread so that um, we're adding to the tragedy um, by people making a lot of horrific mistakes. Um, hydrox Russian hydroxychloroquine being another one. You know, many have heard of the story of the, um, the guy who took chloroquine at home, but it was actually a, 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 just a, a product within a fish cleaning solution or some other thing, and he died from that. So um, the, the lack of clear communication is leading desperate and scared people to do a lot of desperate and scary things. Uh, that lead to worse outcomes. And, and um, um, one such a specific example I, I could tell of this um, is uh, we saw a lot of people um, in the last few weeks coming down from New York City 
because they were told the ERs were full. They were scared to go there. There was a lot of death there. So they were risking long travel just to get a test, just to find out if they had COVID disease or not. Um, and they probably are putting themselves more at risk traveling, staying in hotels, uh, uh, going, coming to our ER, which is infested with COVID, um, just because they were afraid of what going to an ER in New York might do to them. Um, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Monique, we started with you and we're going to end with you before I turn it over to Kate. Um, we have a final question here, which I think is a great one, which is that if someone wanted to uh, have a character with lupus uh, in the story that they're telling, what would be a good example of how, how that could be dramatized or presented? I mean, you know, can you give us a you know, maybe an anecdote or a, a notion of, I, I know every day can be different, and it sounds like one of the things that you have to contend with is what I'm experiencing now and what I'm experiencing three days from now might be night and day. Um, but, but, you know, how would you, what sort of character would you like to see or, or what actor would you like to play you and what scene would you like to see them in? <laughs> <laughs> what actor? That's a great question. Maybe Lupita if she's available. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, I think it would have to be a story of tragedy and triumph. Um, you know, maybe just showing like the arc of the character, someone who is, I, I know you, you said that you see a lot of these patients are very productive, but that's not always the case. It's it's a, a mask for what else is going on, a lot of the other insecurities and shames that they're having. So I think I would like to see maybe the duality of that, you know, someone who's out in the world trying or striving to put on a great face, but then they go home and their whole world is crumbling or their marriage is falling apart and they're financially insecure or their, their kitchen cupboards are empty and they don't have insurance or they're thinking about committing suicide. Like these are very real things that patients are experiencing, but we're too ashamed to open ourselves up to the world because we don't want to be judged. And so there is that balancing act. I would love someone to, to kind of play, you know, the face on face off of, of those characters. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all of our panelists. I mean, wow, we've packed a lot of information um, and, and personal stories. Uh, uh, you know, in, into just a, a very short hour and 15 minutes. And, um, you know, on behalf of, of the Writers Guild of America, and I'm going to turn it over to Kate in a second, I'm sure we'll thank you on behalf of her organization. Uh, we're just so thrilled you were all able to join us, especially you, Dr. Bella, having come straight from the ER to make it here in time. Thank you. And uh, your, your expertise, your compassion, and your time uh, is, is uh, much appreciated. So thank you all very much. And I'll turn it over to Kate. We're going to have to figure out a way to applaud um, via Zoom. I don't know how to do that, but um, I, I hope and I assume all of you are applauding not only Bo and his excellent moderating skills, but uh, especially our panelists. And I applaud you all and thank you so much for spending an hour and 15 minutes or so with us when you all are very, very busy people I know. Um, just very quickly, we have posted in the chat um, links to our fact sheets and infographics on lupus and other information and websites that were mentioned throughout the uh, discussion. So please take a look. Um, if, if the link doesn't work, you can copy it and put it in your browser and it'll take you to um, those fact sheets and so forth. We also are going to put up a survey where we invite uh, participants to uh, answer questions about uh, how you felt tonight went, what did you learn? What kinds of activities or, or subjects would you like us to cover in the future? That sort of thing. We'd love any feedback that you'd like to give us. And a commercial for next week, same time, same station. We'll be dealing with aging and caregiving in the age of COVID-19. Um, so please join us for that. It's a big one also. Thank you again to all of our panelists and to our moderator and to the Writers Guild East and West and most especially to the Lupus Foundation of America for supporting us to do this uh, evening. So thank you all, stay safe and healthy. Good night.